following Jesus Christ, to worship him and praise him and walk in obedience to his will, in holiness and righteousness. For this is the day that you've chosen to continue to walk in sin, in those things that God hates. Yes, everybody has an opinion. Everybody has an opinion. But are you following Jesus, young man? Following Jesus. Everybody has an opinion. But what is the truth? The Bible says in James 4. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. That's what the Bible says about your life. It's a vapor. And most people in the world are boasting about what they're going to do tomorrow. I'm going to make this money tomorrow. I'm going to buy and flip this house. I'm going to invest in the stock market and make a gain. I'm going to invest in my 401k and I'm going to sit on it when in retirement one day and smoke cigarettes on my, on my balcony and just chill the rest of my life. The Bible says you know not what you're doing. In fact, it talks about it talks about a rich man who got richer and richer. Jesus talks about a rich man. As long as they don't make any lewd gestures. That he wanted no, to tear like, down like his farm. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you. bigger one so that he could live on it the rest of his life because he trusted in his riches and in his money instead of trusting in God. And Jesus said. Somebody read, man. And thank Jesus you. said. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Don't you know that your soul will be required? Of
right now. We're here to call you to reality right now. Why you still have breath in your lungs. Why you can still enjoy God's earth. This earth that God created for us to enjoy. Most people walk upon it in their own lust until they repent and come to Jesus Christ. Most people mock at this preaching. They'll walk by in their pride. They'll walk by in their arrogance. They'll walk by mocking and laughing at the Word of God because they are lost. Because they hate the Word of God. They know deep down their conscience that the Word of God is true. That's why there's a reaction. You can't ignore it. You can't ignore the Bible. You see, if there was a Muslim or a Hindu or an atheist on the street corner, and I've seen them before, preaching, most people just walk on by. That guy's crazy. But when the Word of God is preached, it convinces the soul. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And so when the Holy Spirit is active in the life of a preacher, and the preacher is preaching the Word of God, then the Holy Spirit is touching, convicting, working in the hearts. And the way people react and respond can be in anger, indifference, or repentance. So God is calling you to repentance. He's bringing your sin into account now, so that one day you won't have to go to hell for it. See, this is the greatest love that somebody can show you. Somebody to preach the gospel, to tell you about sin, and how it's leading you to hell, and call you to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Call you in repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. You see, God is love. And the Bible says that love rejoices in the truth not in iniquity. Love, true love, does not rejoice in iniquity. And so if you say you love your friend or your neighbor and you're causing him to sin, you don't love that man. You don't love that woman. You don't love that person if you cause them to sin. If you cause them to, to, to uh, do things that are unpleasing to God, like fornication and homosexuality and lying and thieving and stealing and, and watching pornography and all these that, that people do in their sin that I used to do. I used to be a porn watcher. I used to be a lustful man. Hell yeah, did. When the Holy Spirit convicted my heart, I repented. And God, by His grace, drew me to the cross of Jesus Christ. And I repented and cried out to Jesus. And He made me a new man. He made me a new man. That's what it's going to look like. Because you don't know Him. You don't know Him. If you knew Him, you would believe what we were saying. You would believe. That's what Jesus said. They'll believe you if they believe me. He said, if, you, if they rejected me, they will reject you. Okay, thank you. And so still Appreciate God that. is working. And so, like I said before, the Bible calls your life a vapor. You know what a vapor is? A vapor is like steam. Steam, water vapor. I was boiling some macaroni and cheese for my children today, and there was water vapor coming out of the pot and instantly it disappears within seconds. It doesn't stay there, it disappears in seconds. That's what the Bible compares your life to. Your life is a blink of an eye. It's like a vapor. And eternity is forever. You see, as eternity goes on and on, when you go from hundreds of years to thousands of years, to tens of thousands of years, to millions of years, it makes your life it makes your life, your temporal life. Why would you hail the one that wants to kill you? That's foolish. Why? Your life becomes more and more like a vapor. In the scope of eternity, your life is a blink of an eye. You're here today, and you're gone tomorrow. So the question is, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your life? Are you living it for your own sinful lusts? Are you wasting your time just on entertainment? Just going to church on Sunday, pretending to be a nice person, a moral, self-righteous individual, and hiding sin in the heart? Are you walking in sin? Are you desperate to get out of your sin? Well, there's a remedy for sin. There's a remedy for death. And God wants to use your life as a witness for His goodness, like my life. I'm a witness of what God can do in the life of a wicked sinner, okay? I was a wicked sinner, but God, by His grace, called me out of darkness, 
I repented by His grace. I was born again, and His Holy Spirit filled me, and He's keeping me holy. He's keeping me holy, and He can do the same thing for you. You don't have to sin anymore. But the Bible says in Romans 6, sin shall no longer have dominion over us. I mean, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Romans 6. Oh, yes. Whom the Son sets free, it's free indeed. We're no longer sinners in Christ Jesus. We're born again. And that's what God has called you to. But the problem is in America, you have a watered-down gospel. You probably went to a church, so-called, that preached the watered-down gospel. That says, oh, you know, we're all sinners. God understands we're just people. You know, and you can do whatever you want. Change your dreams your best life now. God wants to prosper you, and he wants to give you your best life now. That Joel Osteen message, right? But that's nowhere in Scripture. The life that God wants to give you is life in the Spirit. Life in the Spirit. Your life in the world might be worse. I've gone through homelessness. I've gone through lack. Even in being a Christian, I've gone through trials. I've gone through the death of a child. I've gone through different battles in the flesh. But guess what? In those times, God draws near to me more than ever. He comforts me. The Holy Spirit comforts me. To someone in the world, when they go through the death of a child or the death of a, a wife or the death, some people want to commit suicide. Some people, some people get depressed and they're never the same the rest of their life. But in Christ Jesus, the Bible talks about this, that we should not sorrow like those who have no hope. Because we know that our... Our loved ones that die in Christ one day will rise from the dead. That's the living hope we have in Jesus Christ. But you don't have that living hope if you're holding on to your sin. If you're holding on to your sin, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived, folks. The book of James says the very thing. adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And then it goes on to say in verse 8, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. And we see a lot of party goers, a lot of clubbers, a lot of drunkards, a lot of people that are walking by here laughing it up in the joy of their sin. And the Bible tells you to humble yourself and mourn and weep over your sin that is taking you to hell. You see, God weeps over that. That's what drove Jesus to the cross. Sinners. He went to the cross to save sinners. To save sinners. See? And I was a sinner. Of a savior. And he turned this sinner into a saint. He turned this wicked man into a holy man of God. He turned this this uh, this lost man into a found man. I was blind and now I see. You can't see anything as long as you're in darkness in the world. You'll just go with the sway of the world. What's in the world? Politics, movies, culture, music. You know, whatever's in the culture, you're swayed by it. Whatever your politics are, you're swayed by it. Whatever you think is cool, whatever you think is nice, in the world, you copy that. You're swayed by culture, whether it's hip-hop culture, whether it's death metal culture, whether it's business culture, whether it's rock and roll culture, country music culture, whatever culture in the world, you're swayed by it if you're not in Christ Jesus. You see, in Christ Jesus, you're delivered out of that. You come out of the world, and you become a new creature, and you're swayed by the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus said in John chapter 3. Like the wind, you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So are, so are those that are born of the Spirit. And Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born again. And what, is it, what is it to be born again? Nicodemus asked, how can I enter back into my mother's womb, Lord? You know, you must be born of the Spirit, of water and Spirit, or you cannot see the kingdom of God. And so the question is, are you born again? Are you born again of the Spirit? Do you have the Holy Spirit? 
Protest. You, need a permit for you have a permit yet? If you, if you require yourself, I'll tell you what I'm going to say. Sir? Don't need a permit to protest. We're not protesting. We need a permit for amplification, which we do have. Can I see it? No, sir, you may not. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't submit to you. Okay. Not my authority. I'll call 9 -1. Go ahead, call it. Right, thank you. Love is love. God will just whisk everybody into heaven because he doesn't send anybody What church are you at? Uh, we're from a church in Noonan. Oh, okay. Yeah. What's uh? Non-denominational? Non 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 yes, sir. Or emotional, okay? So are you refusing to show me your permit? Yes. You are? You're not my authority. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. But there's 
so many prophecies about Jesus Christ's first coming and other historical events that happened that have been fulfilled already in the Word of God that prove its supernatural origin. Anyway, back to Jesus Christ. God hates sin so much he sent his only begotten son to die on a cross to save sinners, not only from hell, but to make you holy, so that you would no longer be a sinner, so that you would no longer have to sin anymore, so that you would no longer have to submit to the lust of the flesh. But I, I, it's sad to say that most people that hear this message, they love their sin, and they love their sin so much they don't want to give it up. You see, when I was broken, and I was in my sin, lusting, fornicating, drinking, being, I was a DJ in the club, partying it up, drinking it up, smoking it up. You know, I was encouraging people. I was encouraging people to sin. I was, I was leading others to hell with me, blind leader of the blind, you know? And when I got to a desperate point where I was broken and empty and I saw that my life was on the way to hell, and I, and I heard the gospel, through, over the course, God was drawing me over the course of a year, little by little. I used to do hip-hop lyrics. I used to write, write songs and, and perform on stage. And, and uh, a lot of my lyrics towards the time I was getting born again started talking about death and the end times. You could tell how God was drawing me, you know? And you could see I was thinking about death. I was thinking about hell. I was thinking about heaven, but not knowing Christ. But then I came to the end of myself. And I, and I fell down at the feet of Jesus, and I repented of my sins, and turned away from my sins, and was born again. And God gave me a new spirit. And signs and wonders followed. Signs and wonders. Holiness, you know, I had demons cast out of me. I had other things happen in my life that were amazing, that God did to, to set me free, to make me free. And then I couldn't stomach that hip-hop music anymore. I couldn't stomach playing that music in my car anymore because I was a new man. Why would I go back to vomit? You see? It's the culture in America. It's culture in America. You see, a lot of people think that they have to be a certain way because of their skin color, because they want to be a part of their culture. But let me tell you something, folks. Skin color don't matter. If there's sin in your culture, you got to repent. You gotta repent. I repented of being a Catholic. There's a lot of sin in the Catholic Church. That was my culture. I was a Catholic. I went through all the sacraments all the way up to being confirmed by a bishop. I was an altar boy, you know? All those things. I was confirmed, all the, all the sacraments, up, uh, except for holy matrimony and holy orders. You know, I, I, I grew up in the Catholic faith. My, my grandfather was in the Knights of Columbus. My mom has a master's in Catholic theology. We celebrated Christmas, Santa Claus, we celebrated Easter, all the little holy holidays we did growing up, and I was in the Catholic Church, and I thought I was going to heaven. I thought St. Peter was going to let me in at the end of my life, open those pearly gates, St. Peter, because I'm a Catholic, and even if I didn't make it, my family could pay a priest and pray a mass over me to get me out of purgatory. But little did I know I was a wicked devil, a wicked sinner, and God showed me how wicked I was through the book of Revelation. book of Revelation, it talks about the coming of the Lord, that God is going to come, and He's going to judge the living and the dead. He's going to judge the living and the dead. And it shows in the book of Revelation the types of people that won't make it. If you look at that sign right there, a lot of those are in the book of Revelation that are not going to make it. Homosexuals, liars, the fearful, the unbelieving, murderers, the lustful, sorcerers, those that perform witchcraft, liars, are not going to enter into the kingdom of God. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Paul says, And such were some of you, past tense. So there were those in the Corinthian church that were these people, and they got saved by the grace of God. They got born again by the grace of God. Not so that they could continue saying, you see, most people in America go to their church because it's cultural, right? It's no different than in Iran, Iran, Iraq. You're most likely going to be a Muslim because it's cultural. In America, most people say that they believe in God or believe in Jesus or they're Christian. They identify as Christian. That doesn't make you a Christian just because you identify as such. No more than a real man identifies as a woman or a woman identifies as a man. That doesn't make you 
But the truth is what makes you. The truth. What are you really? What are you really? Are you really a Christian? Are you really born again? Well, there's some cues in the Word of God. There's cues in the Word of God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, like I said, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, sanctified, and just, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Have you been washed and sanctified from the sin that you committed? I have. I have. I used to be a wretched sinner. There was no hope for me. And the very things I would do, Jesus delivered me from them. And he keeps me from them. And when I get tempted in my mind to return to them, the Holy Spirit gives me a way out. And I submit to him. Temptation is not sin. But when you entertain that temptation, and you walk in your sin, then, you, then it becomes sin. You walk in lust. If you look at a woman, Jesus said, with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. And what do you do with pornography? You lust after the people on the screen that you're watching. You lust after them. That's sin in the heart. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. What else did you say? First Corinthians 10. There has no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. There's another sign of being a born-again Christian. Do you flee from idolatry, and do you escape out of temptation? Are you holy? You see, the Bible calls the believers holy brethren. Holy. Are you holy? Or do you still walk in sin? It's simple as that, folks. If you still walk in sin, you're not holy, and you're not born again. You see, the Bible says in 1 John, it says in 1 John 3, 8, he that committeth sin, that Couple means questions for you. you're presently sure. walking Actively in sin, so he right? says God's coming. He that committed sin is of the devil. Yeah, Jesus is going to return. For the devil so, sinned from the beginning. And he said God. For this well, Jesus is God in flesh, and the, the Father will, will come with him. Okay. That he might destroy the Where's works he coming? of the devil. When is he coming? Whosoever is Where? born of God oh, he's not going to enter into Jerusalem. In Jerusalem? Yeah, Jerusalem. Because he's he's born born the Mount of Olives. In this huh? are the children of God manifest, Sorry. and the children of the devil. Whosoever God does is so forgiving. And so merciful. And so understanding. Where's the Bible saying those things? Huh? Where's the Bible say those things? He said that he was forgiving. And do you walk in sin? Fuck, what was the word? I've been drinking a little bit. Do you walk in sin? But you added the word so on it. Huh? You added the word so on that. He is forgiving and he is merciful, but there's conditions to receiving his mercy and forgiveness. You have to repent of your sins and put your trust in Jesus Christ and walk in holiness. Well, as you can't be forgiven, and you won't get out of your mercy. So forgiveness is not automatic for anybody. Either is mercy. It's only given to those who humble themselves, repent, kiss his ass. I'm not saying that. No. No, it doesn't say that. I've sinned since I became a believer, but that's only it's because word word. I turned away from Jesus. So you rather follow the devil who hates you? And I didn't hate does he the hate Bible. me? Oh yeah, he does. I didn't hate Where does it say that in, the, in the Bible that the devil hates me? But I'm not well, Scripture says of those who are following the devil that they're sinners, right? And where do sinners go? Sinners go to hell. So the devil's influencing you to go to hell. So that's just your sign that he hates you. Where the Scripture comes out and says the devil hates you or not. The fact is, the devil influences you to sin, and so... How many people... ...from the Spirit of God, and that's what he offers you. How many people do you know that have been to heaven or hell since the fight? Personally, I don't know anyone who's been to heaven or hell. I'm not, I'm not telling you to go to heaven if you follow Jesus. I'm telling you to go to his kingdom. So what it's like... I feel he's always been to China. It's the battle of good and evil, right? Oh, not necessarily. It's not like a comic book type thing. No, I know. I'm not saying this I mean, is fucking Superman versus goddamn Lex Luthor. The evil's gonna lose, guaranteed. We know, we know the end of the story. No, the end of the story. The end of the story? Yeah. Some revelation. The end of the story hasn't happened yet. So how do you know the end of the story? I read the Bible. Because you read the Bible? Is it a fortune-telling book? 
Folks, no, it's a prophetical book. It tells true. the future before it comes to pass. Who wrote it? Men inspired by the Holy Spirit. Men inspired. But that's not love. Back in, like, when was like it the written? Rainbow around, rainbow uh, it was written around a period of about three or four thousand years. Is a sign three or four thousand. God. It was written it over the period of three or four thousand years. Three or four thousand years. Three or four thousand years. A lot but of yet, shit changes in three or four thousand years. No, God doesn't change at all. God doesn't either. change. I didn't say God changed. His word doesn't change either. I have an earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. His word stands. But what if we just led to believe like that? Have you ever read the Bible for yourself? I have. The whole thing. Not the entire thing. Okay. No. I didn't skim it either, though. No. Most people do. They skim it. They look up websites. They try to contradict it. They don't actually read it with an open heart and mind. I'm not trying to contradict anything. I'm just asking questions. No, I'm saying the way people read the Bible. That's usually the way they read it. They don't read it with an open mind and heart to receive from God. That's the way I feel like most Christians trying to tell them. What's that? That's the way I feel like most Christians read it. They, just, they just read what the pastors and everybody tell them to read and what's relevant to the surface. Right there, it just qualifies <laughs> that for really love. <laughs> <laughs> I've been reading the Bible for 24 years. You've been reading the Bible for 24 years? Never once have I read it to read what other people are saying. To see what what? Other people are saying to me. I read it for what it says. I get that. Or foolishly. Okay. So what about the people who... So let's just say, hypothetically, I'm believing in God. Does that make me a sinner? What's that? Not believing in God? Of course it does. You're an unbeliever. It makes me a sinner because I'm an unbeliever. Yeah, unbelievers will go to hell again. So that's the scripture. What it says, then, then every other religion is just going to go to hell because they don't believe in God? Well, they don't believe in God. Some of them believe in a type of God. Yeah, in a, t in a type of God, but that doesn't right. mean that the, right the one God. true, that's right. the, the right God, yeah. what makes him the right God? Well, he's the only one that's ever been. No, there have been lots. There's other little G gods, but there's demons. Uh, seeking worship of humans. Seeking worship, humans. seeking worship from humans. Seeking worship from humans. And that's not yeah. the only sin that's there. Yeah. There's many sins. So We're that, talking about that. Every so religion has a problem with seek God how they get forgiveness, too. I mean, they all try to... Every other God. Well, that's what I'm saying. Every other God right? has a false Your teaching of how you seek forgiveness. It's sought through works, so through doing good stuff. And so that's why y'all are out here not doing works? Say, I'm not doing this for forgiveness of sins. I'm not doing this for forgiveness of sins. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. Your work. Cause I love God. Trying to prove yourself. No, you by holding up the sign. No, I love but God. If you, know if you loved him, then I love people. Do you ever love him? No, because that's what God tells me to do. God tells me to go into all the world and preach the gospel. If I love him, I'll keep his commandments. So one of your bushes in your yard have been burning? What? So one of the bushes in your yard have been burning? If you're just going to make fun of the Bible, no, I'm not making fun that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to talk about Moses and a burning bush and make fun of me. Actually, I have one in my garden. I never said I have one in my garden. You said that God spoke to you and told you that you should be out here trying to help people, right? So is the only way God can speak through a burning bush? That's just the most. Oh, okay. Okay. So there's other ways he can speak. Hi, baby. Right. I'm loving you as myself by telling you the truth of God's word. You better be careful. You're gonna send me to hell. I'm already going there. The truth of God's word. The Bible says that greater, greater love has no man. Jesus said, but that they should lay down their lives for their friends. Brass, getting down to the brass here. Just a mocker and a scoffer who wants to mock and scoff. If I was doing that, you hate God and love your sin. I'm just let's be honest with yourself. You hate God and love well, your sin. I am very honest with myself. Do you I love your sin. God? You hate God. Do I hate God? Yeah, you do. No, yeah, I don't. Because you love your sin. Because I have this tattoo. Oh, I mean, that means nothing. That means nothing. That means a lot to me. It's nothing. It's a personal journey. God doesn't tell you to put a tattoo on your arm. If you love him, you'll keep his commandments. It's a personal journey, isn't it? Religion, just in general. I'm not promoting religion. I'm not promoting religion. What? I'm not promoting religion. You're, you're promoting God and Jesus. Says, Following Jesus Christ. There's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, that, says, that is Not tattoos religion. on your arms. I get that. No, I was just it showing you. Like that means that nothing. That means nothing to you. To God. That means, that means nothing to God. But God never told you to put tattoos on your arms. This huh? is for me. Well, that's the part of the problem. Is it part of the problem? Yeah. Loving yourself? Well, you're not loving yourself and putting tattoos on your arms. How's that loving yourself? That's how I love myself. Not how God tells you to love yourself. What? Now God tells you to love yourself. No, he doesn't. Yeah. God never tells you to put a, a tattoo on your arm. I'm aware. Yeah, so love your neighbor as yourself. He also told us never to get divorced, right? 
Uh, well, there are actually. He gave exceptions for divorce. Actually. Oh yeah, there are exceptions for divorce. Yeah. there are exceptions for divorce. Deuteronomy 24. No, there are. Deuteronomy 24, Matthew 19 talk about these things. Okay. If someone commits adultery, the person who has been has done to can divorce them and get remarried. He talks about this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. People shouldn't get divorced for the most part. Most people will get divorced for stupid reasons. Everybody that looks half at the marriage, half a marriage and a divorce. I mean, I'm sure, not all of them are from sexual morality. So but what, what's that do with you? I mean, are you divorced? And, and nope. that okay, so what's that going to do with Anna? That you, you brought that up. I don't know why you brought that up. Because that professing so Christians are getting divorced? Is that why you brought it up? Huh? Is it because Christians are getting divorced? So everybody gets divorced. Well, no, not everybody. I'm not divorced. I've been married for 20 years. Congrats. That's fucking, that's actually a really amazing thing right there. But like, yeah, pretty much lots of people get divorced. Right yeah, over half. Over half. And there's no room on the narrow so, way. But if someone claims to be a Christian, it doesn't mean they are a Christian, number one. Number two, if someone really is a Christian, according to the Bible, live a holy life. Now, you were listening to him, okay? What's that? He said you were listening to him, okay? So Just because you say you're a Christian does not mean you're a Christian. What, what, is it, what does it mean to be a Christian? Okay, well, in 1 John 2, 3 through 4, it talks about knowing Jesus and how you can know you know Jesus. Because eternal life and being a Christian is about knowing Jesus. Okay? So it says this in 1 John 2, 3 through 4, Now by this we know that we know him, okay? if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Is it one of the commandments to not get your skin? But yet you live like a devil. Altered. No. That's not one of the commandments. It's in the Old Testament. Yeah, it's in the Old Testament. No. But I, I didn't say God said you couldn't get a tattoo necessarily. I didn't. I didn't ever say that God didn't say you couldn't get a tattoo necessarily. I said that God never commanded you to get one. There's a difference. You doing all right? You know I'm having fun right now. If you're in an airplane, you doing all right? And that airplane was about to crash. I and there was a parachute yeah, on the shelf. Oh, Chris and Charlie there. are over there. Okay. Okay. There's a parachute on the shelf. Yeah. And you were about to Let crash into an airplane. Right? You could sit back and believe that that parachute existed. You I'm can sorry. tell me what Where that parachute is made out of. No, I just, I just said that. that that parachute and say, yeah, there it is right there. I, I believe that. it exists. Oh, okay. But you're still going to die in the place. Yeah, what I was saying was that the Bible doesn't say no, that if someone gets a tattoo, that's necessarily doing a sinful thing. It says live by the commandments. Yeah, that's an old, the, the commandment, no tattoos in Old Testament, though, and it's always related to idolatry. So if, if the reason you're getting tattooed is for the form of idolatry, whether it's idolizing yourself, your body, something you're putting on your body, idolizing that, then it would be sinful, of course. So it goes back to your motives. The New Testament is what we're under, never mentions tattoos. But what I said earlier was not, not that you couldn't get a tattoo and not be sinful in doing it, <laughs> but that God never commands you to get a tattoo. It's a difference. It's a difference. Jump out of it and put on Jesus. That's what that means by believing on Him. So then, you've rolled your whole life on Him. What has y'all out here? That whosoever, and, and furthermore, that believing on Him is a present so active belief. Then, then what has you out here? It's not like, oh, I believe this well, I, I want to Friday and Saturday night. No. It's a present well, just Friday. Because apparently, just Friday. For you personally? For all of us. Okay. No, let's come out here on Saturday. Okay. Uh, so, what about... You know, fuck. Uh, why are we out here? Because yes. we love Jesus. He tells us, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He commands to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And not only that, I love people too. I want them to know the truth. The truth is valuable. I have eternal life. I want them to have eternal life. Why did God send his son into the world to condemn the world? Why not? So basically, you want them to believe the same thing that you believe, or else they're sinners and they're going to hell. I want them to believe the truth. Nothing to do with me. Your truth. No, the Bible. The Bible says. That doesn't make it the truth. I didn't say the Bible makes it true. You want them to know the truth. Right, but that doesn't mean that I'm saying because it's in the Bible it's true. That's not my argument. I do believe the Bible is true, therefore I preach it and share it. But my argument has never been, it's in the Bible, therefore it's true. It's not my argument. But what I'm telling you is, I do believe the Bible, I do believe it's true, and therefore I'm going to go forth and believe it and obey it and share it with others. Okay. So I'm pretty sure this is one of the regular guys that comes out here, and he basically just kind of shits all over everybody. It's like, if you are out here drinking on blah, 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 you're a sinner. 
The Bible says you're that. You're sinning. You're going to hell. Because Bible says drunk drunk to hell. Didn't Jesus turn water to wine? Yeah, but Jesus didn't get drunk. And life. that same Jesus you who turned... That? Yes. You see that? Bible says he never sinned. That's the but the same Jesus who turned water into wine, you know what he's going to do? He sent all drunkards to hell. He sent what? He sent all drunkards to hell. He sent all drunkards to hell? He's going to send all drunkards to hell. He's going to send all drunkards to hell. No, he never told them to get drunk. He didn't tell him to get drunk, but he provided them with the opportunity. So if I give you a computer, I'm responsible if you use it for pornography? Absolutely not. That's your reasoning right there. If I give you a computer and use it for pornography, it's my fault. I'm not talking about this day. We're talking well, about that. Wine in of itself is amoral. Getting drunk is immoral. Okay. And just because God provided grapes, number one, and he provided wine, number two, does that mean he's responsible for your drunkenness? And also, he creates everything, though, right? Well, he's, he hasn't created this building right here. He didn't cre men created that. He created the materials that make that building He created men. Right, and men choose to sin. So in doing that... Well, see, you, I just refuted that understanding. I just refuted that understanding a second ago. If I give you a computer and you use it for wickedness, I'm not responsible for that. No shit, yes. Okay, so God's not responsible for you using your... So, so God's not responsible for you using your free will wrongly. He said that he was. He just said a second ago he's, he's responsible for sin. He is responsible. No, he's not. You're responsible for your sin. He made God. He made man. God made man, and he, and he, and he made men. came down and realized that men are susceptible to sin. <laughs> God made man with free will. Why? Because he desires a genuine love relationship with you. And a genuine love relationship requires free will on your part. If he makes you a robot, it's not love on your part or his part. So with free will comes the possibility of being a sinner, rejecting him, hating him, flipping him the bird, taking his name in vain, and doing whatever you want to do all your days. That's your choice. He gives you that choice. But he's not responsible for your choices. You're responsible. And that's why he's going to send you to hell if you don't repent. Because you're responsible. Every time you've sinned, you could have done otherwise. But you can also so repent. Yeah, you could repent, but you have you have no you have, you have no uh, understanding of when you're going to die. You don't know when you're going to die. So you, you're continuing your continuing sin is, is a death sentence. Sinning is part of the death sentence. Well, the wages of sin. Life is part of the death sentence. Well, the wages of sin is death. So you continue in sin. You're you're not going towards life. You're not going towards repentance. You're you have this if you have it at all. You have this vain hope that someday, somewhere, far away and far off, I'll get right with God. But you know that day is going to come. And as you continue in sin, you harden your heart. And you and people, you know, I talk to lots of young people. I preach on college campuses all the time. They say, well, I'll just get right with God, God later. We well, don't how do you know God you're going to want to get right with God later? We don't deserve how do you know your heart's not going to be so hard you're not going to get right with God? You're not going to even care anymore. How do you know you're even going to have a chance, like a deathbed, a chance to get right with God? You could die in a moment in time. You don't know what's going to happen. So there should be an urgency in your heart to get right with God. That if you hear the word of God, you know it's true, you believe it, you obey it, you repent. Today's the day of salvation. You don't have guarantee tomorrow. Life's a vapor that appears for the time that vanishes away. So there's, it's a vain hope to say, well, I'll get right with God later. You know, that's, that's kind of, that's not even real repentance. Real repentance seems the seriousness of your sin, what it's going to cost you, what it costs God to secure your forgiveness and, and mercy, and what he calls you to. And to play around with that and toy around with it means you don't care about your own soul. You don't care about all the damage and consequences for your sin. You don't care about everything God did for you and what he's calling you to do right now. He called me to talk to you and ask some questions. Here I am, here I am, here I am. By the grace of God, a Well, life isn't about happiness. Yeah, it is. No, because happiness depends on what happens to you. It depends on how you handle what happens to you. Yeah, but it, it, it depends upon what happens to you. Because you, you, you get sad or mad or happy because of things that come into your life. Part of being human. But, but having salvation my joy which is much deeper than happiness isn't based upon what happens around me i can have joy i get joy in the depths no matter what's going on around me i have the peace that passes understanding no matter what goes on around me that's because of god it's exactly what it is man I guess I'll just never have fun my joy. Well, you don't have any joy at all no not in sin there's no joy in sin there's misery in sin Condemnation, guilt, shame, that's all there is. 
Yeah. Where do you find your joy? That are against you. And being a in father. In the courtroom of God. And doing You're my best to make sure that I don't do anything judgment. wrong to anyone. Okay, so let me let me ask you I'm this. I'm perfect. I make mistakes. I do fuck up sometimes. Okay, so if you're a father, don't you want the best for your children? Not the best. I have eight children. Okay, you have eight? Eight. Damn, son. So I want the best for my children. So I desire with all my being to give them everything I can give them that's true. Not just the Bible stuff, but also about life. Where they're going to work, how to handle money, how to drive cars, how to handle difficult situations. I try to pour everything into them as much as I can. Before I have a son who's 18 now, my oldest son. He'll, be, he'll probably be gone in a couple of years, maybe married, and off have his own children. I'm just trying to pour as much as I can into him. And if, if I know the way to eternal life, and not only do I not receive it myself, but I won't, but I won't offer it to them, then I'm not really desiring the best for them. If I, if I know the way of eternal life and I won't give it to them, then I, I, I mean, everything else I can give to them possibly is all vain compared to that. Do you know for a fact outside of what you believe? That what you believe, no that means what you hold true life. to yourself and what you've there read in the book. No other name, but in the eternal yeah, so life is so guaranteed just because you follow this way. Eternal life is only in Jesus. I didn't know that 20, uh, 24 years ago by reading a Bible. I didn't know the Bible. I wasn't raised in a Christian house. I did not know the Bible. I didn't know apologetics. I didn't know how to defend the Bible. Anything like that that I do now. I didn't know that stuff then. What I knew is I was a sinner. I was wicked. I deserved to go to hell. Huh? How wicked were you? I was a drunkard, a fornicator, a body mouth. I got, I drove drunk. I got in fights all the time. You were a person, okay? I was wicked. Okay, I was wicked. I'm not going to go through all, but I, I'm not, I don't glory in that. It's wicked. I don't want anything to do with that anymore. But I was a wicked man, and I knew I deserved hell, and I knew Jesus Christ died for me. And the moment in my own room by myself, not a church with the lights down and hands raised, playing a soft song, in my room by myself in Fort Bay, North Carolina, I gave my life to Jesus, and in a moment in time, I was changed. What caused you to, start to have that? Well, I heard the gospel. I knew it was true. God was speaking to me. I knew it was true. What did he say? He said, repent. That's what he said. I sent my son to die for you on the cross. That's what he said. And if that great love that he showed me on the cross, the only proper response to such great love as that is to love him back and give him my all. And so in a moment in time, 24 years ago, this June, 24 years ago, I gave my life to Jesus Christ and he changed me in a moment of time. All the things I was doing, I no longer want to do them at all, ever again. Moments before, I loved my sin. Gave my life to Jesus, he changed me from the inside out. Now I hate my sin, I want nothing to do with it. That's what he's been for 24 years now. Okay. Some... Well, congratulations. You found your joy. Take it easy. What's your name? I'm Chad. Chad. I'm Kerrigan. Chad, something Kerrigan. for you to read, man. Take okay, it and read it later you. on. I will not be seeing you in heaven. Well, that's, that's yet to be decided. Yet to be decided. Amen. I know where I'm going to be. Well, as of right now, I know where you're going to be. But there's still time. As of right now, you think you know where I'm going to be because I don't believe exactly what you believe. No, the Bible says out of the mouth comes the overflow of the heart. If it burns the heart, the mouth speaks. So when it comes out of your mouth, it tells me what's in your heart. What's in my heart? You're not right with God. That I'm what? You're not right with God. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't take pleasure in that. I just, this is the truth. I, I tell you because I care about you. Good luck on the rest of your journey. I don't, I don't believe in luck. It doesn't exist. Okay. All right. Have a go. Repent, Chad. Yeah. Don't go to hell. How you doing, sir? I'm good. How are you? Sound permit. Welcome to look at it. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome to look at it if you want to. And zoom in if you want. Thank you. All right.
Yeah, just somebody called about y'all out here. I knew who it was. The think, guy told me he was going to call. I think they were preaching anti-homosexuality or something. Oh, okay. I think it was that guy right there. Right there? He's the one who threatened to call. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Well, y'all got a sound pen. Yeah. Y'all good to go. Appreciate it. Y'all don't need a permit to assemble. Cause yeah, of course not. Less than 15. Yeah. Okay. Right. Y'all good to go, though. Appreciate, I appreciate it. it. All right. Thank you. I did? No, I don't think I said that. You you were dancing. You were dancing like you're. I said there's no dancing in hell. Yeah. Oh, you said no dancing in hell. What y'all like? What y'all missing? Like, what y'all talking about? What's about? We're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Turn from your sin to Jesus Christ. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, like cursing. It can be, it can be some, it can be almost anything. But I know it's ten days to say. If well, you want to put that's it like just it. cultural nonsense. It's, it's, it's seven, actually. All right. They talk about, but that's there's a lot more than that. I mean, the Bible basically sin is a transgression against God's law. Jesus said, if you lust, if you lust after a woman, you committed adultery with her. Heard already. I can condemn you to hell. Jesus said, uh, only a man and a woman can be married. Because in First Corinthians six nine, the homosexuals are not into the kingdom of heaven. Liars, thieves, murderers. Jesus said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? If there's corruption in the heart, you're going to speak out cursing, kill, and all that. So I got a question. I ain't gonna say we don't go to hell and like they but only God Are you ready? Yeah. My dad a whole deacon. I ain't trying to hear that. Okay. I don't want to hear that. My dad a whole deacon. Okay. I feel the same. I feel the same. Yeah, man. I mean, here, take one of these. Read this. Read this. Okay. All right. All right. Take care. You love them, you obey them. You obey them. First Corinthians 10 and 13. What about it? No temptation is overtaking you except such as a common to man. And God is faithful. So are you walking in that? Are you? The problem is most people don't want to the humble Come on, man. Right here, dude. Can you prove in the right here. What, the question is, why are you focusing on skin color? That's the question. Why are you focusing on skin color? I can show you in the Bible how you see. You want to know how you know he's the Yeah, show me. Show me. Well, first thing, show me the Bible right here. Okay, I got another question about Jesus. I got another question. If Jesus 
What is my Bible? Why is it depicted as a white man in your Bible? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, you just made a stereotype. You just made a stereotype. You just brought, you're painting with a broad brush. We don't have a picture of Jesus in our church, number one. I don't believe he was white, number two. Okay. What color is brass? So let's talk about that. Let's talk it's, about it's, that. it's yellow. It's yellow. It's yellow. You know what? No, gold. Hey, man, gold and yellow. Huh? Gold, huh? Gold, and, gold, and, gold and yellow. Show me brass that's brown. Show me some brass that's brown, man. Hold on. I'm going to read it like it says. Just hold on. We'll go there. If you guys want to hear the truth about that scripture. Why was his face white? His face was white. It says his head and his, his hair were white. His head and hair are white. His hair was white. His, his, hair, right his hair was white. Head. Head. Hair was white as wool. Read, read it. Go ahead. Read it, bro. Read about the head and the hair being white, bro. Go ahead. Let me show you this. He got a white head. Revelation 3. What? Revelation 1. Do you know what a head is? Google Negro. I know what a head is. Right here. Do you know what a hair is? You know what a hair is? Yeah, I know what hair and head are. They're both white. Skin as brass. Hair and white as wool. Legs. Where were we deceived in our. In our uh, okay, look. Right here. Where were we deceived? Okay, you're focused on skin color. No, I'm not. Here you are. You brought it up. By saying he's black. He wasn't black. I was gonna say that. Yo, he did. That's what he was talking about. That's what he was talking about. Yep. Head and hair are white. Uh oh. White, the right. color. No, no, no. White, like wool. That's right. His head. His head. Okay. Like his feet, like under spring grass, as if they burn in a furnace. So when you see brass burning in a furnace, it's bright orange. That's right. It's glowing orange. So I get Jesus Asian now. It's glowing orange. It's on fire. So what's this depicting? It's not depicting his skin color, whatever. It'd be fake. Yeah, it'd be fake. So when he's talking about the brass, he's talking about as if it burned in a furnace. And he's talking about the glory of God coming out of Jesus. Like when John saw him, it was in his glory. He was glowing. He wasn't white or black or whatever. He's talking about his glory. Well, not only that. He's talking about his skin color. Something goes in a furnace that purifies it. Yeah. And metal goes in a furnace that purifies it. So it's not a like purity. You get purified by fire and by water. Okay, so his legs and his feet are, are burned, I know right? I know so so what what does the Bible say about the feet? It brings the message of the gospel of peace. So his message is pure and perfect. There's no impurities in his message. I know there's no impurities. So his head and his head and hair are like wool. White like wool. Why is, his, why is his head white and his feet are orange? And his legs. No, nothing about black or brown in there, man. You're reading into it, man. You've been deceived. You've been deceived. The Bible is a metaphor. You, you're trying to make the Bible say whatever you want to say. The Bible is a metaphor. So tell me how you metaphored that one, man. The Bible is a metaphor. So, but, you, you, but you pointed to that verse to say he was brown or black. It doesn't say that. Metaphor never, or not? I never said he was brown and black. I said so he was brown. Well, he said he was, and you were backing him up. What is brown? He just showed you. You can't, you can't say I said it when it didn't come out. Okay, but he said it, and you were backing up and trying to go to that scripture. You can't say I said another scripture. Okay, so what do you think? So what scripture did you say? I said his skin is covered with brass. What is color? What color is brass? Burnished brass in a furnace is orange. What color is brass? Glowing orange. Burnished brass that's in a furnace. Not, that's not every metal. Yeah, it is. Have you ever seen brass that's been burned in a furnace? I'm not yes. putting you down. When? Where? I've got brothers in Christ that are just like See? My uncle worked with brass and copper. Okay. So you gonna so tell me? Have I ever seen wind wear? Okay, so so are you telling me that you went up to the brass and it's the same color as your skin? I was born in New 
The color is not the same Most color. Did I say that? No, I'm asking you. I didn't say you said that. I'm asking you. Okay, so if I didn't say it, why ask me? Because that's what he was saying. If I, but I'm talking. I'm, I'm talking, not him. So what are you trying to say? It, it, did I say that? So what are you trying to say? Did I say that? No, I didn't say you said that. Okay, so now you're not listening. Okay. What are you trying to say? Hey, we're going on top. All right, take care. Look down. Hey, either way. Keep searching. I'm not an Edomite. What? Yep. I'm not an Edomite. I'm just saying. Y'all doing good, but. Read the scripture. Y'all read y'all. Oh, we read it. We do read it. Read it for 24 years. Okay. Oh, good. Praise God. I think, I think Jesus that broke something. That there. Yeah. It might like, have. All their faces were like. You know? Yeah, they stopped Stone Cold. Because no one's probably no one's probably ever challenged them on that. Yeah. No one. And if they wanted to go to other scriptures, they'd go there. Hey, quick, quick. Yep. Does the Bible not state though, don't tell people where they're going though? No, never says that. Nope. It's the exact opposite. Really? Yeah. I was just curious. I'm free to read, man. I'm free to read. Right, I'm that. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. What is your price today? Is your price the cup, the bottle? Is your price fornication? Is that what you're selling out for? Oh, my friend, turn away. Turn away from your wickedness. Jesus, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and you have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Isn't it a wonderful thing that God wants to pardon sinners? But you must repent. Because the, 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 the truth is that God could have sent every one of us to hell the very first time we sinned. That's right. But yet God is abundant in mercy. God is abundant in mercy. He's not willing that you perish, but that you come to repentance. Oh, my friends, you must repent. You have to turn. Turn away from your wicked ways. The only way to respond to such love on the cross that Jesus Christ would give for us. We, we who hated him, we who were sinners. The Bible says, while we were yet enemies against God, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for us. Oh, my friends, man. The only way, the only thing we can do to that, my friends, the only way we should respond to that is to, is to love him back because he loved us. Just like, just like you don't, you can't properly say anyone has died for you and rose again because only Jesus has rose again. Someone may have sacrificed themselves for you, maybe, but you can't say that they rose again for you. You can't say that they, they give you salvation. Only Jesus Christ can give you salvation. Oh, you must turn to him. Bible says, if any man loves his father and mother or children more than me, they're not worthy of me. Oh, he loved your life. He loved this perfect world. Oh, he's trying to hold on to this perfect world. Oh, it's in vain, my friends. It's in vain. It's going to perish. It's vanity. It's all going to perish away. Oh, please, to Jesus, so lay down your life for him. We can all be fire and save your life. But he can lose your life for my sake, so find it. Oh, so if you lose your life for his sake, you lay everything down for his sake, you will find true life. That's, that's eternal life. That's the, that's the true life. But as long as you're living in sin, you're not living a lifestyle, you're living a death style. Because that's the wages of sin, which is death. Oh, my friends, turn to the Lord. Seek God. Turn to him that you might be saved. Oh, y'all preach. Yeah. Scripture says the Lord Jesus speaking in Matthew 12. He will make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Then Jesus says this, O oh, brutal vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. 
An evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say unto you that for every idle word men may speak, they'll give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. So Jesus makes it clear in this scripture passage in Matthew 12 <clears throat> that when someone speaks, the words reveal, the words that come out of their mouth reveal something about them, reveal a lot about them. Reveal the most important thing about them, the state of their heart. See, a good man out of the good treasure's heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. And what comes out of your mouth will determine, partially determine, what God will do with you on Judgment Day. So what comes out of your mouth tonight, today? Is it filthy language? Is it taking God's name in vain? Is it OMGs? Is it gossip? Is it lies? And when these things come out of someone's mouth, it's not just the mouth they come out of, they come out of their heart. As Jesus said, what goes into the mouth does not defile a person. <laughs> but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Because it shows the state of their heart. And so when you have wicked and vile things come out of your mouth, it's a sure sign you're not right with God. Don't deceive yourself. And these are the words Jesus says to you. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. In other words, Jesus doesn't like lukewarm people. Jesus wants you to be holy, blameless, and above reproach. Jesus not wants you walking around dressed like prostitutes. Just not want you walking around with filthy language come out of your mouth. Just not want you being sexually immoral and lusting after people. These things are sin in God's eyes. These things will end up costing you your soul in the end. Scripture makes it clear. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Either fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Don't deceive yourself. So many people are deceiving themselves, thinking they're right with God when they're not. People think they're right with God because they feel bad about their sin. It's a little muffling. Is it? Yeah, like from over there, it sounds a little... Test, test. Like crackly muffling. I don't know. Do it again? Test. Test. But I have it away from my mouth. Yeah, a little better. So scripture makes it clear that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't deceive yourself. Don't think in your heart because you feel bad when you sin, because you have intellectual facts about the Bible in your head, or because you go to a church building on Sunday, that you're right with God. If you're out here tonight to lust and get drunk and sin, you're in danger, you're in big trouble, you need to repent. You're on your way to hell currently. Jesus is calling you to repent this tonight. He says, repent or perish. So Jesus said, it's amazing, people, if someone was handing out flyers to a club, a local club, that gave them free admission, people would be taking them like crazy. Free admission to a place you can get drunk and sin. People would be taking it, they'd be lapping it up like thirsty dogs. When someone gives, offers the words of eternal life, reject, no, I'm good man, no, I don't want to get out of here with that. What a shame. We're offering you hope tonight, not hope in sin, hope out of sin. 
hope in Jesus. And if you really love Jesus, if you really know Jesus, you're not going to be out here partying with the world, listening to the same music the world listens to, bumping and grinding to their music, bopping your head, tapping your feet to their wicked music. I'll be drinking the same drinks as the world, dressing like the world, acting like the world. That's not what a follower of Jesus Christ does. Scripture makes it clear, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Don't deceive yourself. If you love this world and the things in it, you don't love Jesus. If you love the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, you are not of the Father. You're of this world. In 1 John 3, Scripture makes it clear. If you abide in Jesus, you will not sin. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Get it clear. Get a clear message tonight. Who are you a child of? God or the devil? There's no in between. There's no gray area. It's one or the other. And if you're a child of God, Scripture says you will abide in Jesus. You will not sin. You'll produce much fruit to his glory. That's what the Scripture teaches. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of of the devil. You see, if you're in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is in you, there's no longer you who lives, but Christ lives in you. In the life you now live in the flesh, you live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave himself for you. If that is your testimony, it's not longer you living, but Jesus living in you, then you know that if Jesus lives in you, you'll produce much fruit. If he is the vine, and you are the branches, you'll produce much fruit. And a tree is known by its fruit. A tree is known by its fruit. You know, sinners will mock and scoff now, but there'll come a day when the mocking and scoffing will end. There will come a day when the mocking and scoffing will come to an end. That's judgment day. Don't wait until that day to stop the mocking and scoffing out of your mouth, out of your heart, out of your mind. Rather stop it now. For God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. He who sows to the flesh will reap destruction. He who sows to the spirit will reap everlasting life. This is what the scripture teaches. If you're sowing to the flesh, you're going to reap destruction in the end. If you sow to the Spirit, if you're a drunk tonight, you don't know Jesus. Drunkards will not inherit God's kingdom. Most of these places right now that are still open, they thrive on getting you to buy as much alcohol as possible. They thrive on it. They thrive on you getting drunk, on being intoxicated. When a man gets intoxicated, he's so bad, so far gone, he's laughing and giggling in his own throw up, and an aimless has to haul him away. They don't care. They want that same guy to come back the next week and get drunk again and spend more money. These places, they thrive on sin, your sin, what they thrive on. 
Most of these places are still open tonight. They thrive on your sin. They don't care about your soul. They don't care about your life. They don't care about your eternity. They don't even care about your life in this world. If they did, they wouldn't allow you to get drunk. They wouldn't offer you things that would get you to sin. Instead, they would love you and care enough about you to get you to stop sinning. That's what Jesus said. Go and sin no more. That's the worst thing happens to you. It's the words of Jesus. What he commands you to do. And if you want to come after me, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses life for my sake in the gospel shall save it. And what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul in the end? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? That's a good question right there tonight. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? A little bit of beer? A little bit of drunkenness? A little bit of sexual immorality? A little bit of fornication? A little bit of lust? A little bit of porn watching? What will you trade your soul for tonight? And then Jesus says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is what the scripture teaches. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Don't end up in hell. Don't end up in hell. Give up your sins. Follow Jesus Christ. Turn to him. Lead your family. Lead your, lead your children in truth. Lead them in truth. Not in unrighteousness. Not idolatry of sports and athletes and teams. Not idolatry of musicians and celebrities. Lead them in truth. And Jesus Christ is the truth. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the light. No man comes to the Father but by him. Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, that's Jesus Christ. Emmanuel, God with us, God in flesh, God incarnate, born of a virgin, performed miracles, signs, and wonders, attesting to who he was, proving he is God in flesh. He suffered in the hands of men, lawless men, who beat him, punched him, mocked him, spit him, spit on him, put stripes on his back, put a crown of thorns on his head, nailed him to a cross. He was dead. He was buried. He rose again the third day, defeating death. And now he commands all men everywhere to repent because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. So many of you are not ready. You're not ready for the day you die. You're not ready for Christ to return. It's going to be a terrible day for you, for so many of you. Just going about your own merry way and your wickedness and your sin. It's going to be a rude awakening for you someday. It's not what I want for you, what I desire for you, what God desires for you as you wake up. The scripture says that God is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. The scripture teaches the sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, oh God, you will not despise. God is not despised. A broken heart, a contrite heart. A wicked woman who dresses in wicked ways and dances in wicked ways and wicked things come out of her mouth. God abhors such things. Turn to Jesus Christ and live. God does not take delight in your sin. 
God does not take the light and you dying in your sin, God wants you to turn and live. So turn and live. Turn to Jesus Christ and live. Don't continue in sin. The ways of sin is death, but the gift of God to turn our life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hey, bro, does it still sound pretty bad? Does it still sound pretty bad? I mean, I can't really tell from right here. It doesn't sound bad from here, but it may, maybe you like going further down. No, it's crackling. So? From my, it sounds like it's crackling from my perspective. Hey, brother Adam, does it still sound bad? Still yeah, what? I'm not sure why it's doing that. I left mine in my car because I didn't think I'd need it, but I probably should go back and get it. Are you able to... Yeah, why don't I have to hold that yeah. at the same time? Yeah, you can use mine. Maybe if there's a difference. Can I hold this? I don't know why it's like that. and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ commands all men everywhere to repent. There's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Amen. Scripture says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins might be blotted out, that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. So God wants to give you times of refreshing, not the refreshment you get from beer, which you throw up later on and it makes you drunk. But the refreshment that comes from the Holy Spirit, which many of you have never have experienced. I've experienced it. There's nothing like the refreshing that comes from the Spirit of God. And Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. We've all been born of water. We all came out of our mother's womb, out of the water of our mother's womb. That's not good enough. That's happened to everybody, it's not good enough. You must be born again. Not enter into your mother's womb again and be born. You must be born from above. You must be born of the Spirit of God. And that can only happen if you repent. God is calling you to repent this tonight. What does repentance mean? It means to give up your sin. Go the other way. To turn the other direction. If you're a drunkard, you give up your drunkenness and become sober. If you're a liar, you give up your lying and become honest. If you're a thief, you give up your thievery and become content with what you have. What the scripture teaches. You know, if you're a fornicator, you repent and become pure. If you're a homosexual, you repent and God straightens you out. This is what repentance is at its core. But there is a fake repentance it, follow, it, it follows worldly sorrow. A fake repentance says they're sorry and keeps on doing it. That's what a fake repentance looks like. It says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, over and over again, but never, never stops. Just continues to trample the blood of Jesus underfoot. For godly sorrow leads to repentance, to salvation not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. And then it says this about Christians. For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourself, what indignation, what fear, what zeal, what vehement desire, what vindication. In all things you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. This is what true repentance looks like. It's not some flimsy little prayer, not asking Jesus into your heart, not closing your eyes and repeating a prayer to somebody else. Real repentance gives it up. It's a complete and full surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. 
And if Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, it will show in how you live your life. And if Jesus Christ is not your Lord, he will not be your Savior. If he's not your Savior, he will be your judge. It's not what you want. You don't want Jesus Christ as your judge. You want him as your Lord, your Savior. You want him to give you mercy, not judgment. Salvation, not damnation. But those are your two options. You understand that after you die, there are no second choices. There are no second chances. Your, your fate has been sealed at that point. But there's still time. You're still alive. There's still breath coming in and out of your lungs. There's still blood being pumped through your body. There's still time to repent. But whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. What is the allotment of God from above? What is the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? See, when it comes to an inheritance, the Father, God the Father, has an inheritance for both the righteous and the wicked. The inheritance for the righteous is a place in his kingdom. The new Jerusalem, the new heaven, the new earth. The inheritance for the righteous is for the unrighteous is damnation. I'll say it again. What is the allotment of God from above? What is the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave shall hear his voice. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. The Son of Man will send out his angels and he will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. They'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of his Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Oh, listen to the word of God. Put aside the filthy music and the wickedness coming out of your own mouth and the mouth of your friends and listen to the word of God. The word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword, dividing soul and spirit, bone and marrow, and discerning the intents and motives of men's heart. Shame on you, you filthy mouth. You potty mouth, shame on you. Repent. Repent, potty mouth. Take heed to the word of God. That's what I call you, a potty mouth, yeah. yeah. You, have a, you have a potty in your mouth, you have a sore in your heart. And you gotta change your heart. Out of the mouth comes the overflow of the heart, the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man with a good treasurous heart brings forth good things. An evil man and the evil treasure brings forth evil things. What the scripture teaches, don't deceive yourself. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. For what is good for necessary edification that may impart grace to the hearers. See, a good man has been changed by Jesus. He's repented, has been transformed by the life of Jesus Christ will take care of what comes out of his mouth. Scripture makes it clear. If you don't watch what comes out of your mouth, your religion is worthless before God. It's vain before God. Out of the mouth should not come sweet and bitter water. It should not be so. But the way it works in God's kingdom, for the God's kingdom man has been changed. The heart of stone has been removed from him. He's been given a heart of flesh. It becomes normal and natural to walk in God's ways instead of walk in sinful ways. You need Jesus Christ to change you. 
He's in the life changing, really changed my life 24 years ago. I'll never forget it. I remember that night as if it was yesterday. It's more than half my life ago now. I remember as if it was yesterday. In my bedroom by myself. I knew I was deserving of hell. I knew I was wicked. I know Jesus Christ died for me on the cross. Dying the just for the unjust to reconcile sinners back to God. And in a moment in time, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And in a moment in time, he changed me. If anyone is in Christ, a new creature, all the old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. Christ changed me in a moment of time. The same promise, the same offer he gave to me, he offers to you. I'm no one special. I was wicked. I was depraved. But God, God is good. God is righteous. God is holy. And this holy God, the scripture is calling you to repent, to stop being unholy. Scripture says as obedient children, as obedient children, not conforming yourself to your former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all your conduct, for it is written, be holy, for I am holy. That's what, that's what Christians are commanded to be, holy, because Christ is holy. As Christians, we're commanded to be holy and righteous and good, not wicked and sinful. Not to pray, not sinning every single day in thought, word, and deed. That is not the normal Christian life. The normal Christian life is one of victory, of overcoming sin. In fact, 1 John 5, 3 says this, This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. See, when I was in the flesh, if I tried to keep the commandments of God, it was a burden to me. I didn't love God. There was a change in my heart. But the moment Christ changed me, in that moment of time, my heart changed from loving sin and hating righteousness to hating sin and loving righteousness. That's what Christ did in me in a moment in time 24 years ago. He changed me, delivered me. He set me free. And he who the Son sets free is free indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth's name is Jesus. He that commits sin is a slave to sin, and a slave will not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if a son sets you free, if the son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus will set you free tonight. Give up your sin, follow Jesus Christ. Forget about this world. Forget about your so-called friends leading you in sin, influencing you to sin, partying with you. Those aren't your real friends. But the good news is that when you get right with God, He will give you real friends, new friends. Friends that love you and care for your soul. Friends that will not lead you or influence you to do unrighteousness. But friends that will lead you to do righteousness. I have, a, I have testimonies of that. I have testimonies of that. When, when I became a Christian, God gave me new friends. Friends who cared for my soul. I stayed in my barracks room for six months. Instead of partying, I read my Bible. And after about that amount of time, the Lord led me to go witness to my own friends. The Lord gave me new friends who were Christians who loved Jesus. Follow Jesus Christ. Don't be deceived. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart. There is no God. Don't be a fool. Don't deny the obvious. Atheists deny the obvious that this world was created by a supreme intelligence, way more intelligent than us. All the scientists in the world, they put them all in one lab. They could not create a blade of grass, a grain of sand from nothing. Yet the God of the universe, the God of the Bible, spoke everything into existence. The God of the Bible spoke everything into existence. The trees, the planets, the stars, the moon. God created it all. It is God who created all these things. The creator of the universe is calling you. Isn't it amazing? For the creator of everything we've seen, the stars, that are so massive, the whole universe is so massive, cares about you. 
He wants a relationship with you. Isn't that amazing to you? Doesn't that baffle you? That the God of all the universe would care about these specks of dust on the face of this small planet? It's amazing to me. Scripture says, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already. He has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. you got to believe in Jesus. You can't believe in Allah. You can't believe in the millions of Hindu gods. You can't believe in the God of Mormonism, who is a human on another planet at some point in time. There are all these other cults that exalt a different Jesus, a different God that does not exist, not based upon Scripture. God is calling you to follow him according to his revealed word. He's given you his word for a reason. Instead of partying tonight, go home, dust off that Bible, get on your knees, open it up and read it. Get a pen and pencil out, pen, a pencil and a piece of paper out, and write down everything in your life that doesn't match up with the scriptures and repent before God. Humble yourself before God and repent. God opposes the proud. God gives grace to the humble. And you must be saved by grace. The only way to be saved is by grace, through faith. Faith in Jesus. This one who was wounded for your transgressions, bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes you can be healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. For we were still without strength in due time. Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. Jesus died for you. He died because you're a sinner, not because you're good, not because you're righteous, not because you're holy. He died for you for the exact opposite. And that's why his grace is so amazing. That's why his love is so wonderful. This is good and acceptable in the Son of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved, to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And so we're here to testify tonight, this man named Jesus, who died for you, to reconcile you back to God. For as a sinner, you are separated from God. Sinners are separated from God in relation to him. You're in danger of being under the wrath of Almighty God, His eternal wrath. Don't die in your sins and go to hell. It's said, repent of your sins, turn to Jesus Christ and live. That's what He wants for you. He wants you to know Him and His fullness. Don't shake your head on Judgment Day. Don't put your hand up on Judgment Day. I think the most terrible thing about hell is the regret, the eternal regret of all the times that God offers you life, of all the times God offered you salvation and mercy and forgiveness, and you rejected, 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 as if it didn't even matter, as if you didn't even care. That's going to be the greatest torment in hell, the eternal regret, the eternal Reminder that you're, you didn't get right with God and you could have. That God reached out to you and you rejected and pushed his hand aside and threw the track in the garbage and disregarded the Bible and the preacher and made fun of him, mocked and scoffed and said, that'd be the most tormenting thing in eternity for sinners. 
Repent. Get right with God. Your sin has done you no good. Your sin has never done you any good, never will do you any good. Give it up already. You'll never solve the problem of sin with more sin. You'll never solve the problem of sin by getting drunk and trying to wash it away. The only thing to wash away your sin is the blood of Jesus. Not Bud Dummer and Miller, Miller Lowlight. They cannot wash away your sins. You look at the drugs or the sex. They can't wash away your sins. You may think you can forget about your sins for a while because you drown yourself in other sins. But the way it works, or they can wash away your sins and make you new, make you clean with the blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. That alone is the only option you have. The Father has given his name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved besides Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the first and the last. Why are you rejecting him? Why are you ignoring him? Why are you acting like he doesn't matter? There's going to come a day when you won't be able to ignore Jesus Christ anymore. That day is coming. What will you do then? Your life is a vapor. I plead with you in Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Get right with God. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. That's the offer of Jesus. Get rid of the heavy burden, the hard yoke of sin, the horrible master of the devil, and cling to the new master, Jesus Christ. Turn from your sins, turn to him in faith, turn to Jesus in humility and repentance, and live. The Bible says God is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but his long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants all to come to repentance. Not the list you want to be on. Is that your, is that your IQ? Or am I your number one preacher? I must be a, I'm your number two preacher now? Why'd I go down a ranking now? Contrary to your opinion, when you give me the middle finger, it does not hurt my feelings. It will not stop me from preaching. It doesn't do me any, any bad. It does you bad by continuing in your sin and manifesting your sin through your middle fingers. Repent of that as well. It's vulgar. It's vain. But the Lord Jesus Christ can even forgive you of that. You know, Paul the Apostle called himself the chief of sinners. He persecuted the church of God. He persecuted Christians. And Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He persecuted Jesus. Yet Jesus saved him. And Paul could make him the greatest apostle ever. He put his life on the line day in and day out to tell people the truth. If God can change Saul to Paul and make him an apostle and have him write half the New Testament, he can change anybody. No matter what your sins are, no matter how great your sins are, Christ can change you. He can deliver you. He can free you from your sin. He can set your feet upon the rock and give you a different life. Turn to Jesus Christ. Turn from your sin. Your sin does you no good.
Everybody's drunk at 2 a.m. There's no one to talk to at that point. So, well, what's the message you're spreading tonight, sir? The message of the Bible. Oh, oh. okay, finally. He's the common sense. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm not good. Here's a, here's a summary of it, though. Well, he can't be a bigger one. Go. In God's kingdom. Can, can I be like, can I believe in Allah, Muslim God? No, there's only one true and living God, the God of the scriptures. But it's the same God, you know? No, it's not. Religion. Not even close. So why is it not? Not even close. Not even close. So why is it different? Well, Islam denies Jesus as the Son of God, God in the flesh. Do you think God is a man or God is a woman? Neither. Neither? Okay. God is a well, God, God, when God speaks about himself, he gives himself the, the male pronouns. That doesn't make him a man, though. He's spirit. I'm a man. He's spirit. I'm called to be like him in many ways as a man, but... Huh? Yeah. 